here at Chosen uh, during this March Madness because the devil is mad <laughs> so it was like I was praying I said God what is it that you want me to say to your people especially after all these powerhouses on went before me so he said after all that is said and done to seal it with a prayer and a praise so we're going to go read Jude, the first chapter, 24 through 25. It's on your screen. It's in your word. And it should be hidden in your heart. So we're going to read together as a family. 
It simply says this. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Let the church say amen. And my topic is simple. God is able. How many of you know that God is able? He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or even think. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you, God. We thank you for being God all by yourself, oh God. You don't need no help from us. We're just a hindrance, oh God. So God, we ask that you just come in the midst of this service, oh God. You take complete control, oh God. Shift the atmosphere right now, oh God. Send your Holy Spirit right now, oh God. Help your way in this place right now, oh God. We don't need to wait to the altar, oh God, to be delivered, oh God. To get whatever it is that you have for us, oh God. But God, right now, in this present moment, oh God, we call on your name. To come and do what it is that we need, oh God. God, have your way right now, God. Use me, God. I'm just an empty vessel, God. That is filled with your word, oh God. So God, release it right now. In the name of Jesus. Oh, we thank you, God, for being God all by yourself. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, ushers. Thank you, ushers, for your kind and friendly service. I do know protocol. Give it honor to God, who's the maker of my life. Amen. So we do thank him. We thank him Praise God. to all the dignitaries in the building. We thank you. So this passage of scripture, June. Jude is the shortest book of the Bible. It only has one chapter and 25 verses. So we do know at the end of this chapter that God is going to present us faultless. But what happened in between to get us to that place? So at the beginning, Jude, Jude was writing a letter to the church. So he was speaking to those that were sanctified, preserved, and called. But his focus was on believers' common salvation. But then something shifted in him that made him compelled to challenge them to contend for the faith. So in Greek, contending means to agonize. Contending means to fight while standing on a very thin bed assaulted. Right. Contending for the faith is different than defending the faith. Right. Contending for the faith is how we live. Right. Contending for the faith has a very interpersonal quality that has to do with our own sanctification. Right. It has to do with running our own race and fighting temptations um, faithfully. Since this faith that we have was entrusted to God's holy People, all believers, not just Christian leaders, not just bishops, not just pastors, not just laymen, but all believers are called to defend the truth of Jesus Christ. All right. So if we are grumblers or fault finders, we are not contenders for the faith. All right. In fact, we are damagers of the faith. Oh, yeah. If we turn God's grace into permission to willfully make our own path contrary to the Lord's word, we are not contenders for the faith, but we are damagers of Christ's testimony. All right. All right. So Jude, the writer of this text today, was just an ordinary follower of Christ. No, he wasn't one of the 12 disciples of Christ, but Jude was a brother of Jesus. Even though they didn't mention it in the text, but he was his brother. So when Jesus declared that he was the Messiah, 
just like any other siblings, if you have siblings, if your siblings say you, that he's the Messiah or she's the Messiah, you're gonna look, boy, you better go ride a bike or something. You are not gonna believe that your sibling is the Messiah. So Jude did not believe that his sibling was not the Messiah. However, the life, the death, the burial and resurrection of Jesus changed his mind. All right. It changed Jude's unbelief into confidence assurance. All right. So Jude goes from warning the church about false teachers and salvation to having them to recognize where the help comes from. All right. So my first point, and I'm only going to need, need about five minutes of your time. My first point, God will keep you from falling. All right. So the business of falling is coming to all humans, even in the Garden of Eden, because of Adam and Eve's disobedience, their behavior caused a chain reaction. Right. So as toddlers, sometimes, if those that have kids or grandkids, um, we know that as toddlers, sometimes when they're learning to walk, they have to stand yeah. in order to learn how to walk. And sometimes when they're they're uh, learning to walk, they just stand, muster up enough strength to just stand. But once they learn and have the strength to stand, then they'll muster up enough strength to take that first walk. So as children, falling was a thing that we did. Falling was at times something that trickled our friends. So when you see your friends as children, you remember when we were children and we would fall, we would laugh. You didn't care who was around, you would laugh. You would laugh at yourself like, man, I fell on that nothing, man. <laughs> and then you would go back and fall again. Playing sports, jumping fence, climbing trees, you're gonna fall because falling was part of the childhood that we lived in. Right. Yeah. We have the bumps and the bruises and scars to prove it, yeah. but even with that, we still fall again. Right. Even in our teenage years, falling was not as funny anymore, but because whenever we <laughs> fell, our thoughts immediately rushed to the find the things to explain why we fell. Right. We try to hide our embarrassment by the time we we're teens. We would look around and see who saw us fall. Yeah. Then we would get up real quick to see, like, man, I don't care who's around, but I don't know what's going on. But falling was totally different as an adult. As an adult, falling is not even embarrassed. But when we're an adult and we fall, we make sure that somebody's around to help us get back up. <laughs> We're looking around this time not for no embarrassment, but for help. <laughs> so even in the senior years, body could be the difference between life and death. Body could mean having to use a cane or a walker for a long time. It could mean being restrained to a wheelchair for the rest of your life. Falling could mean major surgery and long periods of hospitalization. Right. Falling can also mean being confined to a nursing home for life or even the end of life. I remember my husband's great, his great grandmother. So it's his grandmother's mom. So his, his great grandmother, she was 105 when she passed. And I remember a phone call that his brother got that she fell. And at that particular time, Grandma Anime, that you all know, um, that she uh, was taking care of Grandma Lean. So Grandma Lean was the one that was 105. And so Grandma Lean fell in a bathtub. And so Earl, his brother, had to go and help her up. He has no bearing on this subject whatsoever, but he said this was the funniest thing to see a 105-year-old naked. But anyway, <laughs> he was 
like traumatized for the rest of his life. So falling is a serious business, isn't it? So anyway, so Grandma Anime, so she wasn't able to take care of Grandma Lynn anymore because Grandma Lynn fell. Not only did she fall, but she also broke her hip. So when she broke her hip at 105, she was now confined to a hospital bed. Yeah. But then when God called her home, she, he called her home, she was at peace. And so falling is a serious business. We know that humanity changed because of the fall. Right. And what God is trying to say, what, what Jude was trying to say through this, is that God is trying to keep us from falling. <laughs> From falling by temptation, not from being tempted by Satan, because we're all going to get tempted in our lifetime. As long as you continue to confess Christ, you're going to be tempted by Satan. But he wasn't trying to keep you from that, but he was trying to keep you from sink, sink, um, sinking under temptation and from being devoured by him. In the year 1987, I know some of you guys weren't born. 1987, Octavius, <laughs> there was a device that came out in the United States. It was a device that was uh, made to help seniors and disabled people. That when they fall and couldn't get back up, they had a button to press. And the name of this system is called Life Alert. It's called Life Alert. So there was a commercial with this famous lady, elderly lady, who has made this saying super popular that even today we still use it. Help! I've fallen and I can't get up. So then she would use the button or the bracelet, however it was, to contact the operator. And the operator would dis dispatch emergency services to come to their rescue. So she testified that the fall could have been the end of her, but with a little help of a button, she was now connected to the personal emergency rescue team. So through the wonderful eyes of the Life Alert employees, she had nothing to fear. Why? Because she realized that she was never alone. But I'm so glad that in this spiritual Christian walk, that we have a God that is on duty 24 hours watching over our faith. The God of heaven is closely monitoring the safety of our faith. He won't let a circumstance overwhelm us he won't let a fake teacher convince us because he is a God. He's a keeper. He's a keeper of his word. He's a keeper of his promises. God will keep you. Not only will he keep you, but he will preserve you. Now I'm told, I'm not a cooker, but I'm told that when you preserve some things, it doesn't matter how old it is, that it's going to look like it's been, like it's worth it, like it's, it's never been uh, a day old. So when God preserves you, regardless of what the mess you've been going through, you don't look like what you've been going through because God preserved you. Not only does he preserve you, but he also protects you from being just seen and unseen. But he also protects he protects your crazy self from going back to your old ways and doing the things that you know you don't supposed to do. Sometimes we get mad at God because he's doing what we ask him to do. We ask him to do be our protector. We ask him to guide us. But when he starts doing that, we want to get mad at him because we want to order our steps our way. But when God orders our steps, it's the right way. And we won't fall back to the mess that we just got out of. So God, I'm so glad God is a promise keeper. I don't know about anybody else why he brought me from a mighty, mighty, mighty long way. Hallelujah. 
so that brings me to my next point. Give me about five more minutes. Being presented. Being presented. Not only does God keep us from falling, but this is the part I like. He presents us. Not only does he present us, but he presents us faultless. So what does that mean? That means that God is going to present you. Yeah, you. He's going to present you. What, what does that mean? He's going to present you. So what does that mean? That seems impossible that after all that I have said and done in my life, that God is still going to make me stand and cause me to be faultless. So where, where, where are we going to stand? We are going to stand in the presence of his glory. No human in the scriptures was able to stand in the very presence of God when that is face falling flat. So God told Moses he had to hide him because if he's just got a glimpse of his glory that his flesh wouldn't be able to take and then he'll drop dead. In Isaiah 6, 5, Isaiah confesses his sinful and Isaiah confesses his sinfulness and unworthiness after seeing a vision of God. The verse says, Then I say, Woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. That means he was a talker, he was a gossiper. Hmm. He was among the people that was gospel, bite biting, unclean lips. For his eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. But your dirty, your cheating, your lying self has been made to stand up before the Almighty God. Ah, I don't know about you, but I am grateful. That he looked beyond my thoughts. He looked beyond of who I was. He looked beyond all of that and said who I am. Hallelujah. So in, in the condition. So what kind of condition will Jesus present us to his father? He's going to present us without fault. Faultless. Blameless. So in this world we have plenty of faults shortcoming, blemishes. But through the blood of Jesus, we have been washed in the blood of the Lamb and declared righteous. Oh, it's only because of the blood that we'll be able to stand before God. So when you are given a gift, you're not expecting the gift to be dirty, worn, ugly, but when you are given a gift from a spouse, a friend, for a birthday, for a special occasion, for just because, you're expecting it to look nice. Okay? So God or Jesus is not going to present to God something filthy, right. something ugly, yeah. something dirty, and something worn. Faultless means to be innocent of wrongdoing and to be without guilt, right. without defect or blemishes. In other words, you're not guilty. All right. I don't know if you heard me. Yes, it was me. But God said, not guilty. <laughs> I might have cheated, but God said, not guilty. I might have messed up on some things. But God said, not guilty. Yeah, it, it was me put my hands in the cookie jar. But because of God's righteousness in me, he said, I'm not guilty. Hallelujah. Even though you are not sinless, you are blameless before his presence. Jesus had to clean us up and make us presentable before the king of glory, just like the song said, won't he make you clean inside? <laughs> or he may create in us a clean heart so I may worship him. 
Oh, you ought to thank God that there's been a change yes. in your life. Yes. You may not be all that God called you to be, but you ought to thank God that you're not what you used to be. Yes. That you don't smell like the mess that you were in. Yes. That you don't look like the hell that you went through. Yes. But because of God preserving us, yes. mm, but because of God preserving us, with that, not only is he preserving us and keeping us and presenting us with my next point, he's doing it with joy. Amen. Not only with joy, but exceeding joy. That's a different type of joy. You know, when you're happy about something, it's one thing. But when you got joy about something, it's another. But exceeding joy. It's on another level. Yeah, Hallelujah. In other words, there's going to be some shout yeah. in heaven. Well, yeah. <laughs> there's going to be some noise up in heaven. Because well, yeah. if you don't like noise down here, uh, you ain't yeah. going to be able to stand up there. Uh, Why? Because I know for sure, for sure, that there's going to be at least two people in heaven. Uh, Jesus and me. Uh, so when I get to heaven, and I'm rejoicing with the angels. You might can hear it down here. You might not. But let me tell you, baby, it's going to be some joy. Some exceeding joy up in heaven. Hallelujah. So why? Why do we have to wait until we get to heaven to give God praise? Because what did you say now unto him? In other words, now is a phrase of urgency. I know you may came in with some things on your mind this morning, but now unto him. I know that you may be hurting in your bodies, but now unto him. I know that there's some things, some situations, some kids, some people that's been on your nerves, but now unto him. In other words, there is a time to give God praise. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. We may be uncertain in some situations, but still, but God is still God. Yeah. God is able. That's my next point. God is able to turn any situation around. Yeah. So if God can walk on water and ask Peter to walk on water and test his faith, surely he can change your situation. Yeah. If God can raise people from the dead, surely he can heal your body. Yeah. If God can make a blind man see, surely he can make a way for me. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad that I serve a God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that I can ask or even think. I don't know about you or I don't know what you need from him today, but I can tell you one thing. He's able. Yeah. He's able to shut the devil's mouth. He's able to turn the situation around. He's able to shift the atmosphere. He's able to turn some things around for your good and for his glory. He's able to heal your body. He's able to put food on the table. He's able to clothe you in your right mind. He's able to put money in your pocket. He's able to put the devil under your feet. He's able to make your employer your employee. He's But we serve the God who can lift up a standard against him. Oh, I dare you to high five three people and say, he's able, he's able, he's able, he's able, he's able, hallelujah, he's able, he's able to save a wretch like you and me. He's able to subdue all things. He's able to build us up. He's able